A very good afternoon to all the students present in the session. I, Dr. Tanya Bose, welcome to all of you to the fourth session of Complex Analysis. So before we begin with today's session, let us discuss the exercises that I gave you yesterday. Okay. So the first question that I gave you was, find the harmonic conjugate B of U equal to 2x minus x cubed plus 3x y squared. And the options given to you were these four. So yesterday by mistake, the constant was not provided to you in the, answer, in the options. So I've added the constants here. So I think when you were solving this harmonic conjugate, you might be getting a complex constant, right? So I'm not showing you the calculations. I think we did a couple of questions yesterday on the same topic. So I think you have evaluated the answers and the rough option was the last option. B is 2y minus 3x square y plus y cube plus the constant c. And I guess most of you have got the right answer, right? Okay, fine. Now, the second question that I gave you was the analytic function f of z is u plus i of v for which v is equal to x, y is. So yesterday, if you remember, we focused on two things. One is properties of analytic function and the second one was the Milne-Thompson method, right? So in the properties, we discussed two main properties. The first property was that, that if your function is analytic, then the real and the imaginary parts of that function are always going to be harmonic functions and they are called harmonic conjugates of each other. Right? We did the definition of harmonic functions also. Harmonic functions are those functions which have continuous second order partial derivatives and which satisfy the Laplace equation. Right? So this was the first property we have done. And then we did a couple of questions where the real part of the function was given to you and we were calculating the harmonic conjugate, the other pair. Right? And then the second property that we discussed was that if your function is analytic, then the real and the imaginary part, they give rise to two different curves and those two curves are always orthogonal to each other, right? And then one important method, it was a shortcut for you that we have done the milner thompson method, that method focused on that out of these two real and the imaginary part, if any one of them is provided to you in the question, you can calculate the function directly without calculating the other part right otherwise it will become little cumbersome right it will become little lengthy so for attempting in mcqs we did that shortcut right so in the session i gave you u and i told you how to calculate fz in this question i gave the opposite i gave you v and i told you to calculate fz so the options were these four so if we just recall the formula for f dash z we did curl u by curl x plus eta curl v by curl x. Since v is given to us, so I cannot change curl v by curl x, but we can change curl u by curl x. So curl u by curl x can be written as curl v by curl y. And then you have to put the substitutions as x equal to z and y equal to 0. So your equation will get converted in terms of z. And when you integrate it, you will get the value of x. So I guess you have got the option as the second one correct, right? Okay, fine, good. So the ones who have got the correct answers, very good. So now let's move on to today's presentation. So today I will be focusing on these four topics, conformal mapping, standard transformations, bilinear transformations, cross ratio and invariant ones. So once I finish with one of the sections, only then I will take up your doubts, right? So when I'm discussing these sections, please be very careful, right? Okay, so let's first move on to the first topic that is conformal mm -hmm. mapping. Now in conformal mapping, you can see there are two terms. One is the word conformal and the other word is mapping. Now what is the meaning, right? Let's first study what is the meaning of mapping. Okay, so let's go to the definition of mapping. So I think you can see a diagram where the first diagram shows the z plane and the second diagram shows the w plane, right? 
If you remember the first lecture of complex analysis, in the graphical representation of complex variables, I gave you similar example there also. I told you that since in complex variables, we deal with four variables, u, v, x, and y. So all these four points cannot be plotted in the same graph. So for that purpose, what we do? We plot the points x and y on the z plane and we plot the u and v points on the w plane, right? So what are we doing? We are taking x comma y point and we are plotting it for different values of x and y, we will plot the points. So for different values, when you plot the points, automatically you will get a region, right? Now, all those region, when it is mapped under this transformation, when I apply this transformation on all those points, all those points will get converted to, suppose this region, C1. The curve is C1, right? So the function W equal to F of Z, it defines the correspondence between the points of Z plane to the points of W plane. It is similar to your definition of function that you do in plus two level, right? In plus two also, you do the same thing. If you remember there, you say there is a set A here, there is a set B over here, right? And you say that a function F is going from set A to set B. So what is the meaning of that function? It takes all the points of the set A to the points of the set B. So same thing we are having here. All the points of the Z plane are being taken to all the points of the W plane with the help of this function f of z. So this function is called mapping or transformation, right? So the function w equal to f of z, it defines a mapping of the transformation of the z plane into the W plane. So I think the meaning of mapping and transformation is clear to all. Next, we move on to the meaning. So, okay, let me give you an example where mm -hmm. I'm able to express what I meant in the previous diagram, right? Look at this transformation, W equal to Z plus one minus I. So this is a function given to you. What will happen in this function? What is the standard notation for W? It is U plus Ita V. What is the standard notation for Z? It is X plus Ita Y. So when I add one minus eta and x plus eta y, when I just rearrange them, we get x plus one plus eta times y minus one. Now, when you compare the real and the imaginary parts, you will get u is equal to x plus one and you will get v is equal to y minus one, right? Now, let us see what happens to the image. Now, suppose there is this image, there is a rectangular box in the z plane the rectangular box, the dimensions have been marked over here. This line demarcates y equal to zero. This is marking y equal to two. This is marking x equal to zero. And this line is being marked as x equal to one. Now, what will happen to this diagram in the W plane? Let's see. Now, when I talk about this line, this line in the Z plane is x equal to zero. So when I apply this transformation, what will happen to x equal to zero? Let's come to this slide. x equal to zero, put the value. So what is the value of u? u comes out to be one. So can you see that u is equal to one has been marked over here, right? Likewise, look at this line. This line is y equal to zero. So what happens to y equal to zero? Come here. y equal to zero means zero minus one. What is the value of b? B becomes minus one. So we get this line, B is equal to minus one. Similarly, you can check for these two lines also. X equal to one becomes U equal to two. So it becomes this line. And Y is equal to two becomes B is equal to one. So we get this line. So can you see that this rectangle has been shifted to the axis over here in the W table? There is no change in the figure. There is no distortion. There is no change in the shape. There is no change in the size. Only the, there is a axis, shift of axis, right? So this is the meaning of transformation. So this 
curve has been shifted to this curve under the transformation w equal to z plus 1 minus i right okay so this was the meaning of mapping or transformation now let's focus on what is the meaning of conform now what is conformal transformation look at these two diagrams now you can see that this is my z plane x and y axis and you can see that there are two curves c1 and c2 at the point z0 okay so what happens when i apply the transformation w equal to f of z it gets transformed in the w plane as c1 dash and c2 dash and z0 points gets transformed to the point w right now what is the meaning of conformal transformation a transformation which preserves angles both in magnitude and sense between every pair of curves through a point is said to be conformal transformation that means how do we check for conformal transformation we will calculate what is the angle in the z plane so you can see that i have drawn tangents over here right so i will take find out the angle between the curves here and similarly i will find out the angle between the two curves over here if the angle the magnitude of the angle remains same and the sense sense means the direction whether it has been rotated clockwise or it has been rotated anti clockwise so if the sense also remains same then we will say that the transformation is said to be conform but isn't this definition little difficult for doing it in questions in questions is it possible for me to draw the diagram then to measure the angle between the curves and then to find out whether they are same or not so it is bit confusing right so this definition is only for the layman to understand what is the meaning of conformal transformation how do we check it mathematically there is something else for you right mathematically how do we do we say that if the function is analytic in a domain d and at this point we are checking for conformity z not belongs to d with f dash z not not equal to 0 then f is conformal at z not that means how will i check that a given transformation is conformal or not first of all the given function it should be analytic in nature and secondly at whichever point i have to check for conformity i will take out the derivative at that point and if the derivative is a non zero term then we will say that the function is conform right so it's simple enough you will check for analyticity and you will check for the derivative the derivative should not be equal to z right let's see an example let f of z is equal to e to the power z we have to check whether this function is conformal or not so in my lecture of analytic functions i gave you this example there we have checked that the function e to the part z is analytic right so i'm not doing this part we will simply check whether the derivative is non zero or not so let us calculate the derivative f dash z derivative of e to the part z is also e to the part z only and whatever point you put over here you put any point to z you will never get that term equal to zero it will always be a non zero term that means this function e to the part z is conformal at every point in the complex plane right you take any x comma y you put that value here you will never get this value as zero right so e to the power z is always conformal at every point in c clear so is there any doubt in conformal transformation any doubts in conformal transformation okay so conformal transformation is basically you have to take the derivative and the derivative it should be a non zero term and the function should be analytic right now we move to the second section that is standard transformation so we will be discussing about four types of standard transformations right so we will discuss it one by one so i will request all of you to take a pen and a paper so that you note down all the transformations 
Once I explain all the transformations, I will show you a slide where I will incorporate all those transformations into one single diagram and I will show you what is the meaning of each of them diagrammatically, right? So till then, whatever I'm explaining, the key points I will make you write also. So just jot it down so that you can readily refer to it because I will move on to the next slide. So the previous slide you cannot see, right? So look at the first transformation, translation. So note down what is translation. Now in the translation property, what are we going to do? The transformation is explained as W is equal to Z plus T. Where C is what? C is a complex constant. So note down, C should be a complex constant, right? Now let us put down their values. What is W? W is U plus eta V. What is Z? Z is X plus eta Y. And what is C? Since C is a complex constant, so C will also have a real and an imaginary part. So we write C as C1 plus eta times C. So when we put all these values in this expression, what do we get? We get u plus eta v is equal to x plus eta y plus c1 plus eta times c2. So now when I combine the real and the imaginary terms, I get x plus c1 as the real term. And I can take out eta common, so I will get y plus c2, right? So now when you compare these two expressions, what do you get? You get that the real part is x plus c1 and the imaginary part is v equal to y plus c2, right? Okay, so what is the meaning of translation then? That means you started with the point x comma y in the z plane. And when you applied this translation transformation, what that point become? x became x plus c1 and y became y plus c2, right? So the point p x comma y, it got changed to the point p dash x plus c1 comma y plus c2. So in translation transformation, what happens? There is only translation of axis and the shape and the size is remaining preserved, right? So note down, translation is w equal to z plus c, where c is a complex constant. So just note it down. You don't have to note everything because you will get the PDF of the presentation hmm. later on. You can go through it. So just for now, you can note down what is translation. Translation is W equal to Z plus C. Right? Okay. Now. We move to the next standard transformation that is rotation. Now from the word rotation, what is the meaning? That something will get rotated, right? So the rotation can be either in the clockwise direction or it can be in the anti-clockwise direction. So let's see what is this rotation all about. So the transformation in the rotation will be W is equal to Z e raised to power eta theta, right? So here, the figure in your z plane, it will get rotated through an angle theta. So if this theta is greater than zero, the rotation will always be anti-clockwise. And if theta is less than zero, rotation is always clockwise, right? So note down, rotation means w equal to z e raised to power eta theta. If theta is positive, rotation is anti-clockwise. If theta is negative, rotation is clockwise. Just note it down. Okay. So we move ahead. The third standard transformation is magnification. Now from the word magnification, what do you understand? Magnification means when something gets enlarged in size, right? So now let's see what is this transformation all about. W is equal to AZ. So in magnification, W becomes AZ, where A is a real constant. So this number cannot be complex. This has to be a real number, right? So let's see what happens in this transformation. So if W is equal to U plus eta V and Z is X plus eta Y, U plus eta V is 
will become A into X plus Ita Y. So when you compare the real and the imaginary parts, you will get U is equal to AX and V is equal to A1. Right? So now that means any point X comma Y in the Z plane under this magnification transformation will get converted to the point AX comma A1. Now if this A is greater than 1, then your figure will get magnified. It will enlarge. But if this A is less than 1, the figure will become smaller in size. It will get diminished. Right? So noted down, in magnification, W is equal to AZ, where A is a real constant. And also write down that if A is greater than 1, the size is enlarged. If A is less than 1, the size is diminished. Right? So I guess you have noted it down. And then the fourth one is inversion. What is inversion? When you take the inverse, right? Now for inverse, we will convert both W and Z in the polar coordinate system. So we will write W as R into capital R into E raised to power eta phi. And we will write Z as R into E raised to power eta theta, right? So now, the transformation, the meaning is W equal to 1 by Z. So you have to take the inverse of Z. So it is 1 by Z. So when you put down these two values in this expression, what will you get? You will get R e raised to power eta phi is equal to 1 by R e raised to power minus eta theta. Right? Now when you compare both sides, what will you get? Capital R will become 1 by R. And phi will become equal to minus theta. Right? That means, what is the meaning of this? That means the point when under the transformation W equal to 1 by Z, the point R comma theta, it will get mapped to the point 1 by R comma minus theta. So R is becoming 1 by R and theta is becoming minus theta. Right? So just note down what is inversion property. Inversion properties W equal to 1 by Z. Right? Note it down and then we will move ahead. Don't worry. I will explain all of these four transformations again in the next slide. So don't worry. Right? P dash means the point in the W plane. The point in the Z plane is denoted by P. P dash means the point in the W plane. Right? Okay. okay. So now let's move on to the next slide. And look at this diagram. So we have discussed what is translation. We have discussed what is rotation. We have discussed what is magnification. And we have also discussed inversion. Right? Now let us study one by one and let's see the effect of all these transformations on this particular diagram. Look at the center figure. Can you see that this is a figure given in the Z plane, right? And what am I doing? I am applying translation property. So this figure is getting converted to this figure in the W plane, right? Likewise, on this figure, when I apply the rotation property, the figure becomes like this in the W plane. Similarly, when I apply the magnification property, the same figure, it becomes this. And when I apply the inversion property, this figure gets converted to this figure. So can you see the effect of all the four translation uh, properties, the transformations, on a single diagram in the Z plane? Every figure is different from the rest, right? So now let us study one by one what was what was happening in all these figures, right? So let's first study translation. Now look at this figure. There is a rectangular box over here and the coordinates are origin. B point is at 1 comma 0, C point is at 1 comma 2 and D point is at 0 comma 2, right? Now when I apply the translation property, go through your notes. What have you written there? 
W is equal to Z plus T, right? So C alpha, you can give any number, uh, any constant here. So this should be a complex constant. So for this particular example, I'm taking the value of alpha is 2 plus i, right? So when I put here 2 plus i, what will happen to all these four points? Let's see. This point is a point is 0 comma 0. So when I add in 0 comma 0, 2 comma 1. So 0 comma 0 plus 2 comma 1 will become 2 comma 1. So can you see that a point has been shifted to a dash, right? Similarly, B point, B point is 1 comma 0. When you add 2 comma 1 here, 1 comma 0 plus 2 comma 1, it will become 3 comma 1. So can you see that B has been shifted to B dash? Likewise, look at the point C. C is 1 comma 2. When you add 2 comma 1 in this, what will you get? 3 comma 3. So C point gets shifted to C dash, right? And the fourth point D, this was 0 comma 2. So 0 comma 2 plus 2 comma 1 is 2 comma 3. So you get that D point gets shifted to D dash. So if you remember the translation slide, I told you that there will be only translation of axis. It will preserve the shape and the size of the figure. So can you see that the shape and the size of the figure is preserved? Only there is a shift in the axis. So what is the role of translation? It only shifts the axis. So I guess translation is clear to everybody. Now let's focus on rotation. Now again, look at your notes. What have you written in rotation? W is Z into E raised to power I ta theta. So I'm writing here alpha over here. So again, notation can be anything. You can follow any notation. So we did that if your angle is positive, the rotation will be anti-clockwise. And if your uh, angle is negative, the rotation will be clockwise. Now, suppose in this particular question, I take the angle as 30 degrees. So 30 is positive angle. So where, in which sense the rotation should be? The rotation should be in the anti-clockwise sense. So can you see that this figure has been rotated through an angle of 30 degrees? So you can see that this point remains same. Just there is a rotation of the figure and the angle has been converted 30 degrees in the anti-clockwise direction. So this is what is the meaning of rotation, right? Now let's focus on magnification. In magnification, if you check your notes, you have written W is equal to A times Z, where A is a real number, right? So in this particular question, if I take A to be 1.5 or alpha to be 1.5, what will happen? 0, point, 0, 0, when you multiply it with 1.5, you will get 0, 0 only. So the point A remains same. So it, is, it has been termed as A dash. The point B, the B point was 1, 0. So when you multiply 1, 0 with 1.5, what coordinate will you get? You will get 1.5, 0. So can you see that the point B has been shifted to B dash and check the coordinates. It is 1.5 comma B, right? Likewise, this point C has been shifted to C dash and the point D has been shifted to D dash. So I made you write that if A is greater than 1, then your figure in the Z plane will get magnified. And if the value of A is less than 1, then the figure in your Z plane will get diminished, right? So can you see that the figure has been enlarged and by what factor it has been enlarged? It has been enlarged by the factor 1.5. Likewise, if I take alpha is 0.2, I will get a small rectangular box over here. So this whole figure will get diminished, right? Okay. And then is the last one that is inversion. In inversion, you have written W is equal to 1 by Z. Now in this, I will not be telling you about the point zero, how it is being transformed, because you won't understand it right now, because some more complex analysis portion should be done before that. So that is not in your syllabus. So I will tell you about the points B, C, and D. How are they being mapped, right? Look at the point B. What are the coordinates of the point B? B point is 1, comma 0. So can I write B as 1 plus 0 iota, right? 
So one plus zero iota means one only. So when I take the inverse of one, I will get one by one, which is one itself. So can you see that the point B has been written here, B dash, and it is at the coordinate one, right? Next, let us focus on the point C. What is the point C? The coordinates are one comma two. When I write the coordinate one comma two, can I write it as one plus two iota, right? And now when I take the inverse of one plus two iota, what will I get? One upon one plus two iota, right? And you have already done in complex numbers that if there is anything in the denominator containing iota, we always convert it into a real number. And how do you do it? You multiply and divide by the conjugate. So one upon one plus two iota can be multiplied and divided by one minus two iota. So what will you get? You will get one minus two iota upon one minus four iota square. So you will get one minus two iota upon one plus four, that is five, right? So what are the coordinates now? The coordinates will be one by five comma minus two by five. So can you see that C dash, the point C has been written over here as C dash and the coordinates are one by five comma minus two by five, right? Likewise, we have the point D. What are the coordinates of point D? It is zero plus two, zero comma two. So I can write it as zero plus two iota. So when I take the inverse of zero plus two iota, it is simply one by two iota. So I can multiply and divide by iota. So I will get iota upon two iota square, which is minus iota by two. And minus iota by two means which point it refers to? It refers to zero comma minus half, right? So can you see that the point D has been marked over here, zero comma minus half, right? So in the rest of the three transformations, you can see that the shape almost remains same. Either it gets translated through some axis or it gets rotated or it gets magnified or diminished. There is only one transformation where the shape becomes totally different. This was a rectangle over here. Now we are getting something like this, right? So this is the meaning of all these four standard transformations. Clear? I think with the help of this diagram, I could make clear all the, all the transformations very clearly. Right? Any doubts still here? Okay. So I'm not getting any doubt. Uh, why did I complete the circle with dotted line? I told you that for that you have to have some other knowledge for inverse points. So that is not there in the syllabus. So just I told you how to plot those points, how to get the points B dash, C dash and D dash, right? Okay, inversion I will again uh, explain. For inversion property, I'm not getting into the details how I got this circle, right? Because for that, you need more knowledge about complex, right? That is not there. So I'm just telling you how you are getting these points. How are these points B dash, C dash, and D dash coming from? So just look at the point B. The transformation is 1 by Z. So the point B is 1 plus 0 iota. So the point is 1. So when I take the inverse of 1, I will get 1 by 1. And it is itself 1 only. So the point B is at the same position. It has been marked as B dash. Similarly, the point C. C refers to the point 1 comma 2. So 1 comma 2 means 1 plus 2 iota. So when I take the inverse of 1 plus 2 iota, what will I get? 1 upon 1 plus 2 iota. Realize it. Multiply and divide by 1 minus 2 iota. So you will get 1 minus 2 iota upon 1 minus 4 iota squared. So you will get 5 in the denominator. So you will get 1 minus 2 iota upon 5. And that will make the coordinate as 1 by 5 comma minus 2 by 5. Right? So 1 by 5 
is somewhere here. Minus 2 by 5 is somewhere here. So the point C dash has been marked over here. And likewise, the point D refers to 0 comma 2. So it refers to the point 2 i term. So when I take the inverse, I will get 1 by 2 i term. Again, when you realize the denominator, you will get i term upon i term. So it is 1 i term by 2 i term squared. That will become minus i term by 2. Minus i term by 2 refers to the coordinate 0 comma minus half. So the point D dash 0 comma minus half is somewhere here. So I have marked the point D dash over here. So this is how you get the inverse, right? I hope I could make it clear the ones who were asking me this question for inversion to repeat. Okay. Okay, fine. So we have started what are the four standard transformations, right? We move on to the next section that is bilinear transformation. What is the meaning of bilinear transformation? So we have seen how these transformations on their own affect a single figure in the Z plane. But when all these transformations are together combined, that means translation, rotation, magnification, inversion, when all these four are combined together, it leads to a new transformation known as bilinear transformation, right? So now there is another definition, a more better definition of bilinear transformation. A bilinear transformation is written as W equal to AZ plus B upon CZ plus D, where the product of these terms, the cross terms, the cross terms are AD and BC. So you have to take their difference. AD minus BC should not be equal to Z. And these A, B, C and D, they are complex constants. So any transformation W which is written in this form where AD minus BC is not equal to zero, then that transformation or that function is called a bilinear transformation. And there are two more terms with bilinear transformation. It is also known as Mobius transformation or linear fractional transformation, right? So I'm again repeating the definition of bilinear transformation. Bilinear transformation is a combination of all the four standard transformations that we have just started right now. But mathematically, how do we write it? We write bilinear transformation as W equal to AZ plus B upon CZ plus D, where the difference of the cross terms AD minus BC should not be equal to B, right? Okay. Let's see an important observation that this Bilinear transformation is always a conformal map. Now, we did the definition of conformal map in the starting. How do we check mathematically for a conformal map? We take the derivative of the function, and if that derivative is not equal to zero, we say that it is a conformal transformation, right? So, we know that a bilinear transformation or a Mobius transformation is written as W equal to AZ plus B upon CZ plus D. So you can quickly take the derivative and check. Are you getting this term? I'll give you one minute. Just check. Will you get this term? You will apply the quotient rule and see. Are you getting the derivative in this form? Okay, so I think most of you have got the derivative. Now let's check, is this derivative a non-zero term or not? If this derivative is non-zero, then it will become a conformal map, right? So when I solve this expression, you can see that CZA will get cancelled with CZ. So what is left? AD minus BC. And in the denominator, we are left with CZ plus D whole square. 
And if you remember the slide of bilinear transformation, I told you that AD minus BC is always non-zero if it is a bilinear transformation, right? So it is already given that it is a Mobius transformation. So the numerator term is always a non-zero term. Likewise, CZ plus D is a square term. A square term can never become zero, right? So this is automatically a non-zero term and hence it becomes the conformal map. So this can come in a MCQ question, one mark question. That is every Mobius transformation of a formal map, right? Something like this, the statement can become. And so you always have an important observation for bilinear transformation that it is always a conformal map, right? So next we move on to is inverse mapping. Now if W is equal to AZ plus B upon CZ plus D, if I want to calculate the inverse map, what does it mean? It means that we have to calculate Z in terms of W, right? So how will you calculate Z in terms of W? You will obviously cross multiply these expressions. You will take all the terms on the left side of Z and bring all the rest of the terms on the right. And then you will simplify the expression to get the value of Z. So when you do it, you will get that Z is equal to minus DW plus B upon CW minus so inverse mapping is nothing but to calculate Z in terms of W. W in terms of Z is already given to you. You have to calculate Z in terms of W. So you can quickly cross multiply the terms and check whether you are getting Z as this or not. I'll give you one minute. Just quickly check it out. So some students have already get the expression. Okay. Yes. Now, so you can see that you still use two minutes or so to compute the inverse mapping. Now, when you are attempting this in an MCQ based question, so how to utilize, how to manage your time? So what is the shortcut behind it? So if the mapping is given to you, if W is given to you, how to write Z directly without doing the calculations? Please see, very carefully listen to it. First of all, what observation do you see? Can you see that in W and in Z, these two places, B and C, they remain the same, isn't it? First of all, in place of W, I have to write Z and in place of Z, I have to write W that I've already written. And then the observation that I see is that B and C, these two places are the same. What about the rest two places? In the rest of the two places, A and D, they are getting interchanged with the opposite sign, right? So if it is A here, I have to write, this is plus D, so I have to write here minus D. Here it was plus A. I will write here minus, right? So I'm again repeating it. These two places will remain same. B and C will remain same. In the next two places, A and D, you will simply interchange them with their opposite sides, right? If it is minus A over here, here you will write plus A. If it is minus D over here, you will write here plus, right? Okay. So based on this shortcut, let us look at the example, MCQ. You have to find the inverse mapping W equal to this. So you can see that, let's recall, the options are given to you. W is AZ plus B upon CZ plus D. So what is A? A is 4, B is eta, C is minus 3 eta, and D is 1, right? Now let's quickly see what was our inverse transformation. I have to, in place of W, I have to write Z. In place of Z, I have to write W, right? And then what I have to do? I have to interchange these two positions. 
with the help of the negative sign and the rest of the two places they will be kept same right so can you see that i have interchanged these positions here it was 1 so i am writing here minus 1 over here here it was 4 so i am writing over here minus and these two places b and c they are same plus iota minus 3 iota right now simple calculations you can see that none of the option is in this form so i have to modify it so when i take out minus sign common from the denominator and i multiply it in the numerator i will get w minus iota upon 3 iota w plus and can you see that the second option gets substituted right so this is how you will do the questions of inverse map is it clear i think this was simple enough okay now this is an exercise for you so i'll discuss the answers tomorrow so you can just note it down what will be the inverse mapping of w equal to 3z upon 2z minus i so i think you have noted it down now we move to the next section that is cross ratio now this is another important topic and the questions of cross ratio and bilinear transformation they always come together right so let's first understand what is the meaning of cross ratio and then we will go to the questions right okay previous question i will not explain today because that is the exercise given to you so you will try it on your own and i'll explain it tomorrow right okay now let's see what is the cross ratio cross ratio is if there are four points z1 z2 z3 and z4 taken in order then the ratio w equal to z1 minus z2 z2 minus z3 z3 minus z4 Z4 minus Z1 is called the cross ratio of Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. Right? So you will find that how will I remember this term? Very difficult, है ना? No, it's not difficult. Let's see how to remember it. We will first move from top to bottom, then we will go in this direction, and then we will again come down. Right? And what is the order to be followed? We will follow the order in which we have written these four terms. So you have to write Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4 in order, and then we will see how to write the ratio. So first we will go from top to bottom. That means from numerator to denominator. So start from the first pair, Z1 minus Z2. So I've written it here. Then we will go to the next pair, that is Z2 minus Z3. We will write it in the denominator, right? Then we will move ahead. We will go to the numerator back. We will take the next pair. The next pair is Z3 minus Z4. We will write it in the numerator, and then we will again come down. That will we will go to the denominator. And what is the last pair left in order? Z4 and Z1. So we will write Z4 minus Z. Right. So this is how we write the cross ratio of four terms taken in order. Right. Now where it will be applied? Let's see. Look at this example. Find the bilinear transformation which maps the points z equal to one minus iota minus one to the points w equal to iota zero and minus iota respectively. So I told you that the questions of cross ratio and bilinear they come together, right? So in this question you can see there are three points given to you. In the last slide, in the cross ratio we were talking about four points. so where is the fourth point and similarly even in w there are three points given right so in every question always three points will be given to you what will be the fourth point we will always take the fourth point as in z plane we will take the first point as z and in the w plane we will take the first point as w right and whatever points are given to us that we will write in order 
So the first point in Z plane is Z, and then you can see the next points are one minus i tan minus one that I have written over here. And likewise in W plane, the first point is W, and the rest of the three points I have written over here, right? So I'm again repeating. Always three points will be given to you in the question. You will assume the Z point, the first point in the Z plane to be Z, and the first point in the W plane to be W, right? Then how to get the bilinear transformation? Okay, so let's first of all write the cross ratio of these four numbers, right? Now we have done what is cross ratio, how to write the cross ratio. So in the Z plane, this is Z1, this is Z2, this is Z3, and this is Z4. And in the W plane, this is W1, W2, W3, and W4, right? And we know which order we have to follow. We have to follow the N, capital N letter, right? So let's see. We start from Z and we will take the pair one by one. Z minus one, written in the numerator. Then we will go in the denominator. The next pair is one minus minus iota. That becomes one plus iota. Then we have minus iota minus minus one. That becomes minus iota plus one. Then we will go in the denominator. It is becoming minus one minus z. Right? So I followed this pattern only. I will put this equal to the cross ratio of the points of W. So in the W points also we will follow the same procedure. W minus ita that is written over here. Ita minus zero it's written over here. Then zero minus minus ita that becomes zero plus ita, and then finally minus ita minus W. Right. So I think there is no doubt in this step. I've explained it, and then. What is the target? We have to calculate the bilinear transformation. That means, what was the definition of bilinear transformation? W is equal to a z plus b upon c z plus d. That means I have to calculate the value of w. This is my target, right? So I have got this expression. Now my target is to calculate w. So how will I calculate w from such an expression? It looks so horrible, right? So how will I calculate W? Let's see. So let's simplify this expression. So I'm writing it as Z minus one. You can see, no, I have not changed any of these four terms. They are written as such, right? Look at the right hand side. Zero plus iota is iota. Iota minus zero is iota, right? And these two terms are written as such. So there is no change, right? Let's move ahead. Let's see how to calculate W. This is the same step carried from the last slide. Now, I have opened up the brackets. I have multiplied these terms. I have multiplied these terms over here. Then I have multiplied the terms over here, and I have written here. So you can just check: Will you get these? This expression? Will you get this ratio? Quickly, 30 seconds. Just check. Okay, now our target is to calculate W, right? So now how to solve this expression? This doesn't look so simple, right? So in your junior classes, you have done about componendo and dividendo. So let's recall what was componendo and dividendo. If you have two ratios A by B equal to C by D, then what does componendo and dividendo do? You can add a plus b upon a minus b. It will become equal to c plus d upon c minus d, right? So we will apply this rule here. With the help of this rule, what will happen? Some of the terms will get cancelled. So some of the terms will become simplified. So let's see when we apply component to dividend over here. So we will get this expression. Again, I'll give you 30 seconds. Just check on applying component to and dividend to. Do we get this, right? Just check it out.
So I hope you got it. Okay. Now let's simplify this expression. So you can see that Z gets cancelled with minus Z. Ita gets cancelled with minus Ita. In the denominator, minus Ita Z gets cancelled with plus Ita Z. And minus 1 gets cancelled with plus 1. Likewise, on the right hand side, W Ita gets cancelled with minus Ita W. And 1 gets cancelled with minus 1. So whatever terms are left now, let's simplify them. So in the numerator, we are left with minus 2 Ita Z minus 2. Denominator, we are left with 2Z plus 2 Ita. And on the right side, we are left with 2 upon 2 Ita W. Right? So now what can be done? We can take out 2 common from the numerator and denominator and cancel that 2 on both sides. So that is what is being done in the next slide. So I have cancelled that 2. And you can also see that there is a minus sign common in the numerator. So you can keep that minus sign on the left, but I have taken it towards the right. So there is no harm. You can keep it on the left side also, right? So can you see from that such a big expression by using component or dividend, we could reduce it to a smaller expression. Now, what was the target? The target was to calculate W. So by just cross multiplying the terms, can I write Ita W as this? I have taken this term over here and I brought this term here and I have taken this term towards the right side, right? So I get this term. So this is the value of Ita W. So what is W then? Ita will be transferred to the right. So we will get 1 by Ita. So you can multiply the denominator with Ita. So what will I get? Minus Z plus Ita in the numerator. Denominator will become Ita squared Z, which is minus Z plus Ita, right? Now you can absorb this minus sign in the denominator and it will look like Z plus Ita upon Z minus Ita. So we have calculated the bilinear transformation of the type AZ plus B upon CZ plus D, right? So I think this question is clear. How to use cross ratio in the four points of Z and W? One of the students was asking me that why did I equate the Z points to the W points? Because it is given that the Z points are being mapped to the W points. So with the help of the transformation definition, we are writing W equal to F of Z, right? Okay. Now, you can uh, observe in this particular question that all the points that were given to you, they were finite points. Now, suppose if one of the points becomes infinity, then what happens? Look at the next example. Find the bilinear transformation which maps the points Ita minus Ita 1 of the Z plane into 0, 1, infinity of the W plane. Right? Now, you can see that the points of Z plane are fine. They are finite. But what about the points of W plane? One of the point is infinity. Now, how to tackle this infinity point? The method is same like we did in the last question. But there is just a crux in this that how to deal with this infinity because infinity is not defined, right? So how to deal with it? So what we will do is do the same thing. We will write the points of W plane. We will write the points of Z plane. And we will apply the cross ratio definition and we will equate them, right? So let's first of all identify what are W1, W2, W3, W4 and similarly what are Z1, Z2, Z3 and Z4. So as I told you in the last question that three points will be always given to you. You will assume the first points in both the planes to be that particular number, right? So for the W plane, we will take W1 as the first point as W and the rest of the points are given to you. So W2 is 0, W3 is 1 and W4 is infinite. Similarly, for the Z points, Z1 is equal to Z, the first point. Rest of the points are Ita, minus Ita, and 1, right? And you also know how we write the cross ratio, right? So we will follow the capital N symbol to write the cross ratio. And you can see that I have written it as W minus 0 here, 0 minus 1, that is written over here, then 1 minus 
Now this point is infinity. So I will not write here infinity. I have marked infinity with the term W4. So I will write here W4, right? So only the point infinity, don't write it over here. Write it as the term that we have designated it as. So write it as W4, right? Similarly, in the denominator, it is W4 minus W4. So I will do that, right? It is equal to same cross ratio definition here, Z minus iota here, iota minus minus iota, that is iota plus iota, then minus iota minus one, that is over here, and then finally one minus Z, that I put over here, right? Now you can see that this point is a problematic point, W4 as infinity. How to remove this point? How will we remove this point when it is in a ratio? What we will do, we will take out W4 common from the numerator as well as from the denominator, right? So when I take out this W4 common from the numerator and denominator, what will I get? W4 will come out, W minus zero will become W. So when I take out W4 common from this expression, one will become one upon W4 minus W4 is taken out, so we are left with 1 over here, right? Similarly, 0 minus 1 is minus 1. I have taken out W4 common from here, so W4 is out. What is left? 1 minus W by W4, right? And in the right-hand side, I haven't changed much. Ita plus Ita is becoming 2 Ita. 1 minus Z is written over here. And you can see that uh, from these two signs, terms, minus sign can be taken out common and I have absorbed that minus sign in the first expression. So it becomes minus z plus ita, right? And if this term becomes ita plus 1, right? Now, let's move ahead. So this is the last step that I was telling you in the last slide. So here you can cancel out this w4 first of all, right? w4 gets cancelled. Then what happens to these two terms? If W4 is infinity, what is 1 by infinity? 1 by infinity is equal to 0. So this term is manageable now. This is becoming 0. So 0 minus 1, now it will be a finite term. So you will get a minus 1 over here. Likewise, W by W4. W4 is infinity. So W by W4 will become 0. So again, 1 minus 0 will become a finite term and you will get plus 1 over here, right? So you get W into minus 1, minus 1 into 1, and these terms are written as such, no change in this. So in this, minus 1 gets cancelled, and you get the value of W. I have opened up the brackets over here, and I get this expression, right? And then I can just further simplify it. What I have done, I have taken iota common from the denominator, so I'm get, writing it as 1 by iota and then I'm realizing it and multiplying it with iota and dividing it by iota. So I get this expression. I will multiply the numerator with iota. So all the four terms, they get changed. And in the denominator, iota into iota is becoming iota squared. So I get a minus sign. So I get minus 2 plus 2z. And then finally, I can write this expression as I have taken z common from the first two terms. So I get 1 minus i times 2z. And from these two terms, I've taken out minus sign common and I'm getting 1 plus i. And similarly, I've just changed that position. So I'm getting 2z minus 2. So this becomes my bilinear transformation, right? So we saw one example where all the points were finite and the next example where one of the point was an infinite point, right? So the methodology is same. After applying the cross ratio definition, we have to calculate the value of W, right? So it's not necessary that in every question you have to apply component to dividend to. Like in this question, already you got the value of W. But if you get a big expression containing the rest of the terms, then you have to apply component to and dividend to to reduce your terms, right? Okay. And then we move on to the last definition of invariant point. This is very, very simple. What are invariant points? The other name of invariant point is fixed points. The points which coincide with their transformation, that is, for those points for which f of z is equal to z, 
they are called fixed or invariant points. From the word fixed, what does it mean? That this term Z is remaining fixed. You apply the transformation, you still get the same value as Z. So all those points for which the transformation coincides with the points, those points are called as fixed points, right? So let's see an example, and then we will end the lecture today. The fixed points of the mapping W equal to four plus I times Z. We have to calculate the fixed points of this mapping. Let's see how to calculate it. Let's recall what was the definition of fixed points. All those points for which f of z is equal to z, right? So what is the value given to you as f of z? f of z is 4 plus eta into z, right? So now when I solve this equation, what will I get? 4z plus eta z is equal to z. You can bring this z on the left side. So you will get 3z plus eta z is equal to 0. Finally, what do you get? z into 3 plus eta is equal to 0. So can 3 plus eta become 0? You are getting a product of two terms equal to 0. So can 3 plus eta become equal to 0? Never. So which term will become 0? z is equal to 0. So which is the fixed point? The fixed point is z equal to 0. So which is your correct option? The correct option is z equal to 0. Right? I hope this question is clear to everybody. It's very simple. You will simply put f of z equal to z and you will solve the value for z. Whatever answer you get for z, that is your fixed point. Right? And second exercise for you people to, for today, you have to find the fixed point of this mapping w equal to z plus 4 iota. And we will discuss it tomorrow, right? So you can note down this question. Okay. So with this, we come to the end of the session. If you have any queries, you can ask me. Otherwise, we'll close the session. Yes, there will be a class tomorrow also, same time. Any doubts? Okay, so we close the session. So if you have any doubts, you can mail me at tanya.bose.chitkara.edu.in. So till then, take care and we meet tomorrow for the same class. Okay, I'm ending the session, right?